Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to present Danielle Hosenberg, who's been kind enough to come down from Cambridge to talk to us today about his model of a process of design. I will leave him to give you the important details, but he has a practice in individual and collective designing that I think is quite important. Danielle and I connected through the ideas of cybernetics, I think, and we overlapped at some conferences. And he kindly invited me to speak at a series that he organized at MIT in the PhD program there called Cybernetics and Design. And I'm thrilled to be able to reciprocate on this occasion and have him come that to New York. Agreement, speaking. No? I, I invited you because... Uh, huh? I don't remember it that It took part. you like two years to invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm slow. It's called <laughs> slow food, slow code, slow inviting. But we made it. We also had a great time that day, I remember, because Marvin Minsky was supposed to come to my talk and he couldn't. But we roped him into coming to a seminar with you and your colleagues. And Marvin and his wife, Gloria, were wonderful and very open. And we had a really fantastic conversation. And with that in mind, we do want to turn this into a conversation soon. And Danielle will speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll get into it. And then there's drinks, and we hope some more conviviality in the other room. I'll leave, again, Daniel, Daniel to speak exactly why he does what he does. I feel that it's important because it's ethical, because he has a point of view on design which is different or part of this shift away from designing for users to designing with and by users. But he will make the distinction much more subtly than I just have. Most important to me is that he wants designers to be aware of the responsibility of the relationship between designers and designed for, or designed by, or designed with. We call these people users. It's a horrible word. But I think his methodology brings us more toward participants, which could be one of a better word. And with that, I'll leave Danielle to explain. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if like, people come, come, maybe the man come closer. <laughs> I mean. That's a great idea. We should, we should so first of all, I'm very happy to be here, also in this great city. Uh, I really like New York, and thanks, Paul, for inviting me uh, today, even though it took him a while. <laughs> <laughs> so I like uh, to start with this image, which is, I don't know if you recognize it, but it's an image from this story about the, the great inventor Daedalus creating these wings for Icarus. Uh, to somehow illustrate the great moment that we're living today where we have this amazing moment for us where uh, new interactive technologies are kind of changing our, the, way of, uh, the way we live more than ever. And I say more than ever because we all know that through design we are continuously changing the way we live, but lately through these new technologies where kind of the rate of, of, of change is increasing, increasing much more. And this is I promise this is the only boring graph I'm going to show today. I put it at the beginning. But it show right uh, very briefly just to show that it takes so much time to kind of adopt certain technology. But today, and we all know we can experience this in every moment, of, uh, even in, we are in our daily life, how uh, new things appear. And actually, probably you are also like bringing these things to the, to the world. And they are changing the way we live. And this is also, and you know this, I was asking Paul about this school. I mean, this school, I think it's six years old. Design also is be, being redefined, and it's becoming really like uh, before, I don't know, like 10 years ago, design was maybe related to graphic, industrial, architecture, but today, at, uh, yeah, form making. Or, and today is being redefined, and we are realizing that designers, we have actually like a big responsibility, and I will come back to this. Uh, idea later to this process of change. And one of the things, the way design has been redefi redefined, and this school probably is also like trying to, un to understand what this means, but design as experience design, right? So we talk about design as experience design, user experience design, the uh, user-centered design. There are different ways in which we are redefining this idea. This is one. Another one is design as making. So the maker movement and the 
do it yourself and then uh, fab fabrica personal fabrication is also this idea of design as making. And then design as ethnography. So we are also like looking and, and this may be related to design thinking as design and other ways we're trying to really redefine these uh, concepts. Um, the idea of what design actually means, uh, how we practice and teach design. And what I talked about is transformational design. And here I want to give a little bit of context where I'm coming from when I'm talking like this. I'm coming from a program in, uh, at MIT called Design and Computation. And we, in a way, look at the design process and develop tools and methods for designers. And we have a very critical stance to the way things are. So it's, we usually don't take how things are, but actually look at the, at the way they are and like propose things related to them, but we, and my proposition is called transformationalism, and that's what I'm going to present today. The subtitle has been changing a lot, so it will make, keep changing through the presentation, and I hope to your feedback. But it's basically a model which I call operational because it's to be used. It's not just to model and explain, it's, it's to be used. Uh, and I'm going to use this project as a reference uh, throughout the presentation. This is a project I built for the 150th anniversary of MIT in the lobby, if you have been there in lobby 10, next to lobby 10, next to the infinite corridor. And at that time I was, I'm still really liked analog electronics, so I was, all this is fully analog, there's no microcontroller, it's, it's a operational amplifier only. And it has these magnets and a sensor in the back that I built and people will somehow uh, interact or I would say now experience and and yeah and at that time I remember like people will ask me about this installation like so what is this I call it my Maxwell's dream that was the name but people will like still not be comfortable with okay so what what is this and I will finally say okay it's art and then ah, okay it's an art installation so <laughs> there's no problem like there's no problem about this uh, but yes, this is, was two years ago, and after I finished this project, I started doing the research that I'm going to show you today. And I'm going to use my own uh, design process from the origin of this project until it was uh, uh, engaged with the people as a way to relate the whole presentation. And I'm going to use this model that for now looks very complicated, but I'm going to explain it into detail. For now, just for you to know, there's the materials here, some sort of arrows representing the experience and the, the designer and the other person. And I'm going to go into details. And I'm going to show the model in relationship to the work that I've done teaching workshops. Uh, I've done a lot of workshops. This is part of the research in which I try out this model and, uh, through a particular game, which I call it a game instead of calling it a method, but it's, pro it's a model and a method played as a game. Uh, and the first part of the presentation is related to the notion of experience design, which I think is great that somehow designers are getting interested in experience, but I think they don't really know yet how to actually talk about it and really engage in the processes with this re difficult sort of concept. And the experience design, uh, Mostly, I would say, six uh, these sort of interfaces and like uh, experiencing the screen. And the, the, the main problem that I see, this is me, to, to experience design the way I, I, it has been developed, is that they, they actually, this, the designers don't have the vocabulary they can use. So they, uh, they end up not really ex actually designing with experience as their design subject. Uh, I talk like this, this design, as design subject, because it's in the interest of the designer to work with this. It's not really designing an experience directly. It's a, it's a tricky uh, distinction. And in my model, I start really taking this concept seriously and trying to explain, I feel bad at the people there. <laughs> Hello. Uh, what, it, what is experience? And I'm gonna ex uh, give you now some sort of des a description, but in, for me, experience involves the material world, which usually we, we, we tend to talk a lot, 
the person and some sort of contact that happens. Uh, and, and I will come back to this question again. This is, again, another image of my project and asking the question that people ask me at that moment, what is this? And I will come back to this question throughout the presentation. So what are, what is our, what is, what are things? This is, uh, I told you that I'm developing this vocabulary as a response to talk about the experience. And I'm gonna do a little exercise with you if you want. If you, no, you have to do it, it's an <laughs> obligation. So I want you to uh, pick up your hands like this and like cross your fingers, okay, all of you. And then I want you to do this, and, but close your eyes, move your arm, close your eyes, move your arm slowly, and then get closer to here. And then with the two fingers, and please take a moment and pay attention, try not to think, and just pay attention how that feels, how that feel. Like move your fingers up and down. Some people are laughing already. <laughs> okay, so the idea is that you were doing something, okay? And the way I describe doing is uh, involves the senses, but also you were moving, you were moving your arm, and touching, and touching involves move, movement. And some of you may also have started thinking about how ridiculous this is, and maybe you start laughing. And this thing that we do feels in a particular way. So you, it, in order to be there, it, you, have, you are actually feeling it. Uh, this is related to the idea of awareness. So you can be aware of both the sensory, the sensory sensations, which are the actual, you are touching, so you, you feel that, and the emotional ones, that I distinguish from the idea of, of emotions. I talk about emotional sensations with our, for me, felt emotions, because emotions are the names we give to what we actually feel, which, for example, in some of you, after thinking, you th thought this was kind of ridiculous or whatever, and you laughed. So it, something happened to your body, and you felt that too. And then we may distinguish the material, so you may have distinguished the nose. Or in my case, when I do this, I feel two noses. I don't know if anybody was able to feel that. So the world that we live appears to us through what we do, feeling what we do, and the materials appear through that. And the material world, the way we actually talked about it, are, are labels. So we recognize the world through labels, names. So at, at the moment when you were a baby and you, start to, you started touching here, your mom told you, nose. To me, it would tell you, nariz. And then, and then, yeah, nariz. But I had to touch it and move with it and then recognize it with this label. And my vocabulary it goes into detail to all this uh, uh, concept, but I, I want to emphasize that my vocabulary it's uh, not, then it's not, doesn't have definitions, are evo only evocations. So it's for you, that's why I do this exercise to try to explain it, because you have to feel it directly. It's not like, there are no definitions of how things are. These are also words, I mean. So this is the vocabulary, and I'm not, I'm not gonna go into details. These are all evo evocations, but if you are interested, I can like share, share it with you. I also have, Half of the, that is not here, I have like some sort of collective principles of the vocabulary. So how you, all these ideas you talk when you talk about other people. So they become a little different. When I talk about my emotion or I talk about the emotion of another person. So very basically I offer, all the vocabulary is only trying to give you this, which is very basic and people say this is very obvious and I think it's so obvious that we don't see it. That we can talk about the experience and may, there may be other ways we can do it as feeling what we're doing with the materials, where feelings are the sensory and emotional sensations, the doings are our movements, the senses, uh, that in the senses include thinking as a very, not trying to explain what thinking is, but actually how it comes to you experientially. So thoughts come to your mind the same way smells com come to your nose. So if you pay attention to your thinking, it just comes. You're not think you don't think about thinking, it's like talking, I'm just talking now, I'm not thinking about what I'm gonna say. 
and through that, the materials in my world appear to what I do. But then this becomes what I call a stream of experience. So in, a, in, a, in the present moment, this is unfolding. And I, don't worry, this looks very di uh, difficult, but mainly I want to say that in the moment I'm doing this, I'm moving here. But then through reflecting on what I've done, I may construct a, na a na narrative of what I've done, but it's always retrospective. So in the, mo the experience is unfolding right here, right now. But then you may think back and say, oh, I move my hand, I touch my nose. But in the moment where you were doing that, it was just unfolding and happening. So I take this idea of the stream of experience with the concept of, of, of the vocabulary, and I start, this is already what I do with the students. Yeah, let me get some water. So this is the game. And in the game, I explain them the, this, and then they create expressions of experience. So I've started developing different ways in which we could express in terms of this vocabulary. But I felt at the end that the best way was through drawing instead of writing. And so we draw what we do. We do these sort of moments, different moments that we construct. We color the feelings um, I take. They told me not to mention, I, I practiced this before, they told me not to mention the Buddhist background of this, but the sensations are either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And the way I'm describing it, so when you, it's the same when you people try to describe the sensation, say, this is hot, you, hot is a word. So it also when you were a baby, maybe you touched something that it was hot, it was unpleasant on the fingers, and your mom told you, that's hot. Okay, and you, got, and you name that sensation with these concepts. So the way I do it, we just uh, paint the bodies through using three colors representing these sensations. So I developed this sort of very rough uh, stories where people uh, con constructed this narrative of these different moments. These are, there should not be time. We're not trying to cut time equally. are just moments. Maybe I'll move a little here for these people now. <laughs> Uh, and then after some um, uh, iteration, this is also uh, iterative, through the work with the people, I developed this thing that, which I call experience canvas, which allows to uh, have a space enough to paint the sens bodily sensation, both emotional and sensory, and the body through these different uh, movements and uh, gesture positions. And I paint the material, so I have a, a, a way of uh, more organized than the way I showed you before. The materials are in yellow, the material world, so that it goes to the background. The body appears in black, the sensations in these three colors, and then I also have a way to show the emotional, general emotional sort of response, which sometimes is not directly, for example, like I like going to the sauna and maybe like sens sens my sensory could be very unpleasant, but I emotionally, I really like it. So there are these different levels. Um, and I've, I've, I've done this work with communities, uh, this workshop, this game. This is I've done with uh, people in Chile. I'm from Chile. So we have the mountains, and I work with the uh, miners. And I work, we have the ocean. It's very nice. You should come visit. Uh, and we have the ocean, and we did this with uh, a group of fisherman or a person related to this. Um, and they will, we will go to, to the way they, way they lived, and we will create these drawings of their experiences, and then we will talk about them. And this is very important to me, and, and this is the, the key concept that I talk about transformational design. What is transformation? And I'm very careful with words. Everything has to be, if I'm talking about transformation, so this is, a, Instead of just talking about innovation or just change, what is interesting about the concept of transformation is that it's a change in the conservation of something else. So for example, I really like having dinner in, with my family, so I will set up the table and rearrange certain things in my house and create certain conditions and transform this particular maybe ways of living so that I can conserve uh, having dinner together at eight o'clock, whatever. So it's not only change. It's, an, it's a nice concept, but this also is a concept that I borrowed from Mat Maturana, which is uh, uh, 
he, take, he talks about uh, biology in this, in this, in this way. Um, so with the people, and I here like also do design with them, uh, and I want to say here, and I will come back to this later, this communities, they don't, this is the first time they were exposed to a, a PC, personal computer, and we use Arduinos and sensors, I think like that with them. But according to these reflections on their experiences and what they want to conserve or change from the way they live. Uh, so for example, they re rearrange materials, and I will come back later to this, uh, to create, for example, they realized through their drawings that the landscape was full of artificial sort of separations, and they didn't like that. So they created these sort of sensors uh, that will uh, replace the physical bar um, fences, that's the word, I think. Uh, to some sort of thing that will produce a sound that will make the animals not to cross or like s system like that. Uh, which, I mean, they work in certain ways, but of course they use this uh, very quick uh, way of prototyping. Or in the case of the people that live next to the ocean, they realized that they were, it was interesting because through this exercise they realized that they, they became aware of the presence of the wind that they told me that they usually don't, don't see it because they, it, they live there. So they decided to create this sensor that according to the wind, it will turn the wind into intensity of blue light and will position this in different points of the landscape to be able to see it and be, make it more uh, present in their lives. So they, again, this is a change of something they want to conserve. They want to conserve this connection with their the wind, so they created this. These expressions, though, and I again want to be very careful, these are only drawings. Again, they do not replace the experience. These are constructions that they, and I also this, I find this through my, through my research. And they work as evocation. So they, are, they evoke an experience, they are not the experience. And the way we talk about, uh, when, when we share, we share these drawings with each other, the feeling of others, I see it in, li in the light of my own, both emotional and sensory. So if I see somebody crying, that's an expression of experience. And I think today uh, we should be a little more careful the way we talk about emotions because that's only an expression which I've cried before, so now I can like see because I felt it myself. Uh, but that's a, a little distinction I wanted to make. And this is, the slides for this where, again, I told you at the beginning that I felt there was a lack of a vocabulary and I offered this vocabulary that I, through this, this very design process that I show you, I, I think it can be used by designers uh, in their design processes. Um, but of course, there may be other ways uh, to do it. Uh, and second, design as making. Um, Design as making pursues or seeks the automation of design via fabrication. This is like via the technology or personal fabrication. This is a little bit of a caricature, but I was uh, outside reading this Maker magazine, and then you see all these things that people have made, and they tell you how to make them. But that's it. I mean, printing the Eiffel Tower with pressing a button does not really teach you how to make anything that is new. So. What I'm saying, my critique to the maker movement is that through learning how to make a thing, you're not really make, learning how to make anything that is new. Because you're only learning how to make something that is already known. So the guy that is explaining you how to make a thing, he made it, and he's telling you how to make it, but that's it. And uh, I had a friend that went to a maker friend, he was surprised because he told me like, and this is not me, I promise. Everybody was just printing Yoda heads and then talking about design, and then no, there was no much design there, I would say. This is not to say that the 3D printer is bad. I mean, you can use it in very creative ways, but it could be dangerous in certain contexts where you are talking about learning how to design instead of just making a thing. Uh, so the way I talk about it, and then I come back to my model, so we started from the experience, right? But I talk about rearranging materials. So we're not really making anything. So we go cut a tree that we find in, in the world, pick up some stones, 
put them in particular ways, we rearrange them, we go get inside, sleep, get out and call it a house. Or the, I like to talk about cooking, like would you pick a couple of potatoes, milk from the cow, water from the river, put it together, and then, and then you experience it. So I rearrange some materials and then I do, and I feel something with these materials. And then I can keep going. And if I don't like the soup, I can find other materials or change the stones of my house. And like, so the house becomes what, what it is through what I do with it. You will get tired about this question, I promise. What is this? Anybody knows? Do you recognize? Huh? Yeah, so this was a model that I built. And I told you I was going to show you also my design process. But I'm going to unveil my, the, the real process. And I'm going to get almost naked here telling the truth. Sometimes designers don't want to say. So this was, in my proposal for the Maxwell's Dream, we proposed with my friend Kostov what we call at that time an analog projector. This was going to be here in the ceiling. And we were super proud because we wanted to put this magnet with maybe like a couple of motors, and through maybe only two motors, create patterns that will be projected here. And with a Kinect, whatever, this was like some years ago, it will, be, it will control the projection. But what happened when I built this thing? Uh, here it is. So this is the drawings. You can see that at, at that time I was mostly an architect making drawings. But I built this model, and this is what happened. What happened? But what happened to me? I touched it. So it was not supposed to be touched. It was going to be up here. And I touched it. I said, oh, look, this is really nice. Why do I have to put it there? What's Probably maybe better this is like, I don't know. Do you think it's kind of nice to do it? I never thought about doing that. I mean, it was spontaneous. So through what I did with the same exact materials, so the rearranging part, the making, is not different. The same magnet, the same screws. Through what I did, this, these materials became something different, completely different. And that's when I'm talking about experience as uh, that things become what they are through what we do. So if I pick up, usually when I present it, there's a bottle. No, there's no bottle. If I take a bottle and I drink with it, it becomes a bottle. But if I hit somebody in the face, it becomes a weapon. And in design, what is interesting is that in, 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 as part of the process, a new thing begins to appear through what I do with it. And it's spontaneous. It's, I didn't think about it. So what is this? Still a question, but it's, be, it's becoming. So I, instead of the making, I say design is moving the body. And that we rearrange the materials in order to move, to do something with those materials so that they appear as what they are. So when I'm making a house, I'm rearranging some materials that then through what I do with these materials, the, the house be, appears as a house. Um, and I talk about improvising as a moving which is new, in, in, spontaneously new. Like what happened to me when I moved this was uh, uh, spontaneous, was an improvisation which I didn't thought about and then did it. It, uh, it just happened in, uh, in the process. And probably, if you are designers, this has happened to you m multiple times. Um, so in the work, in the, in the game where I play with the students, I, I explain uh, this model and look with them at what they do in the design process. Uh, pretty, pretty much, especially when we work with, uh, we use these electronic materials, they, they do it naturally, spontaneously. They put the sensors, they, they are designing with their movements. They're not just, even now I'm talking, like I can, we're not like this, like maybe you are too used to be in the front of the computer. But look at yourself, the way you design, you're probably moving around, talking about what, what, what things. And, and the making, which I, I don't want to say that it's not important. It's very important to have uh, the tools. If I'm cooking, I want to have a good oven. I want to know how to cut with the knife, I want to have the knife. I want to have all the, this is for me is the engineering part, the part. 
which usually we forget. And the only way we teach design is through, through this, through the rearranging. And I, I mean, for me, it was fantastic. I was able to learn electronics in, at MIT and use the machines, and it's totally, it's great, I'm not saying. But that's not enough. That's what I'm saying. They also engage in, with, the, with their bodies. So now I want to do actual experiment with you. And this is, I'm, I'm writing my PhD thesis, and I promise you I'm going to include these results. OK, how many people are, how, we have here? Is, I can use this, like 40, 30 people. So I want you to tell me, what is this? If you know, raise your hand. And don't be, just raise your hand if you know what it is. Huh? Nobody? What is this? Huh? Yeah, physical model. Yes. What is this? Huh? Another sketch. But what is, what is the thing? What is it? When I talk about the house or the, do you know what is this? What is this? People say drawing machine. Okay, people say this. What is this? Guitar huh? Guitar pedals. Guitar pedals? Okay. I should take notes. <laughs> what is this? A labyrinth. Labyrinth. What is this? Virtual reality. So these are, um, what I'm saying now is not what they are. I want to say these are what the people in my workshop designed. Okay, and for me the great, uh, one of the things important for me that I found on my research is what I call unrecognizables. When you design something new, they become unrecognizable. And I have just proven you that, I guess. When you're designing something new, you don't have a name for it, and you make up a name. I was looking today at the projects that you had from last year, some of your, what your projects, nice projects, you put a name. The, I don't know, there was one called something I forgot, but you, you, you name it. And we have, I was talking to you at the beginning, all these new things that appear. What is Google? What is iPad? What is uh, Kindle? Blah, 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 blah. I mean, there are names. There are labels. When I told you that when you were a baby, you learn how to call something, the nose, in design, because we're creating something that transform our experience, we have to name it because we don't recognize it with a known name. And we, we as designers, were actually uh, extending our language and create, and our dictionary becomes broader because there are new verbs and new names. I was talking to Paul about bicycle. People, when you were a kid, you, in my case, my dad, show me this weird thing, but these materials, these rearrangement materials, and I, I, they, he told me what to do with it, I experienced it, and he told me, bicicleta, that's a bicycle, you're biking. And then suddenly, I would look around and recognize bicycles. It's similar to when you, uh, before you learn how to read, I don't know if you remember that moment, where you will look, walk in the city and you will see patterns, or when you go to, if you go to Japan or to other countries and you don't recognize the signs, once you learn how to read, that's it, they appear. And for me, it's impossible to look at a sign and not read it. I don't know if that's happened to you. So we think the bicycle is a bicycle, but that's only a label that we're learned to recognize our world through these things that appear. So when we design, things are unrecognizable and we name them. So the material here, in design, we feel and do, we feel what we do, but the material we name, and we build up a new name, and it appears. So when I start moving with this thing, it start appearing, and I didn't know what it was, and I had to name it. And this, so design, you're bringing through through moving, bringing forward an experience, and then I don't want to get out the idea of thinking, but for me thinking, you can still think about intentions. So you can decide 
I want to design for well-being, or I want to, you, you could have intentions, or even this, an intention that could be very specific as an object. I want to design a bicycle, which I think is tricky. In my workshops, I don't let them use, as part of the rules, you don't use names for things. You just rearrange them, and they appear. But then through, through this spontaneous process of appearance, you can reflect and say, oh, I, I, this is not a bicycle. This is a new way, I would call it Segway. This is Segway, a Segway, it's not a bicycle. So you can reflect and think about it, or reflect and think this is, well, this is not really um, working for well-being for me or for others. You can reflect on that. And in the workshops, I've been using this sort of Arduinos and Cersos. I like to call them, instead of input devices, output, the do devices and the field devices, I put it from the point of view of the body. So I, the, 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 the speaker is not making a sound. I'm, I'm hearing the sound. I, uh, I, I, I press the button. I touch the sensor. So I put it in the other way around. And we use recycled materials. I will recommend, I always, when I go to design schools, please, let's use recycled materials. There's a lot of cardboard outside the street that we can use. Um, that's why also these objects that you saw were so ugly, which I like. But I also saw this in my workshops, in some of them, where to use the, the, the technologies that are available for prototyping, it's very different. You see there, this person is, in, is engaging directly with the materials, but here we need to get the Arduino, download, up, we, have, we need a computer, and I also did this with the community and figured, realized that you need to download the software, the drivers, connect it, open it, write code in English, it's not minor, upload it, and then only after that you can move with the material. So it takes you a while, the rearranging is long, and you can move with them, it takes you a while to, it's, it's, separate, it's separated. So I'm, I develop a thing I call spaghetti, uh, which is basically uh, replace the Arduino for this, I, at the beginning I showed you these different modules with different sensors. This is the same, so it allows you to use four type, until eight type of sensor, eight type of uh, actuators, and then my, map out the relationship. Uh, so I build up this system, so it, it's very basic. It's work as like, you can map out how much you wanna pass through like a distance sensor, for example, this is the distance sensor, I only wanna measure this, so I can cut up the signal to take up that part and then I only want to move the motor like this so I can define the ranges for both directly by hand and without the computer. So it's, it's there, it's direct. So I don't need the computer, I don't need words, I don't need numbers. It's purely direct. I touch it and I see it right away. Uh, I also like the idea that it's a spaghetti kind of looking like, so it's not, there are a lot of things out there that are building blocks, like Lego blocks, like the little bits, things like you connect and you create these trains that are like, this is free and you can put it anywhere. And I did, I went to a very difficult place to work with this, uh, to a community of blind, a school for the blind in Chile, in the, that was actually also in a, a little town. So it's a little town, like similar to the town I show you with the other people, but then also a school for the blind. And they, uh, we designed, we went through this same process, and they designed, for example, a glove, I'm gonna use a name now, but uh, with which they could feel, they translated the distance to the intensity of vibration, and they could feel the distance to the space and walk around. But the interesting thing for me is that they designing for themselves. So I'm not giving you, the, ma the maker here is not giving them how to do it, they, they give them the materials and they, they rearrange them. So they also rearrange the materials and wear them directly, always moving their bodies too. and they try things out, they, they move their bodies with them. So they, they, these things appear through moving. 
And one of the problems that we have today that everything is so visual that it's actually hard to show a project that is felt in the hand, right? So design, I think design is bringing forth the new through moving the body. Uh, this is the last part, don't worry, I'm gonna finish. Design as ethnography. So for me, the, the, the design ethnography pursues the, what I talk about, the matching. Matching the user's need with what the client's products are offering. Um, and, and for me, the problem here, and it's related to the two previous ones, is that um, designers through this approach, they do not actually see that they are part of the process, that they are transforming their own experience uh, also, and the experience of others. Uh -huh. Because they're trying to capture as if the experience was an object that I could like look, analyze, and take and put into into a, a in, into like some sort of anali analysis, and that then I can specify through my design this, what other people are gonna experience. And and I I told you I wanna show you my process. This has become interesting now to me because then this is be becoming collective. So what happens? when I give these things that I rearrange to somebody else. Now, I can observe. That's all I can do. And the interesting thing, is I'm asking you again, what is this? And then I, I also again, ask, uh, this is my architect background coming to me and making me feel weird now because I will leave this in day and go, and I will come out in the morning, I will find this. So uh, the MIT students will spend all night, they realize they could force these magnets, and instead of make them move like this, they start stacking them, you see? Mm -hmm. They start stacking, I was like horrified. Oh no, they did this and I will fix it. Every day I will come like furious and I will fix it. And then this was great for the MIT students because they, they I think they created some sort of game and they will try to stack as much as they could. And every, every day they will do this. And then I realized, oh, this is, again, another, this tr was transformed again through what they did. So this was not the thing that will repel, it was a game for them to stack this thing up. So the, even th this, through the, the, the people, this changed another time. Also, I always thought about this as a screen that they will look at. Very, I, I thought about this almost like a, I call it Maxwell's dream painting with light. I thought this was gonna be almost like a canvas for painting. But people were there, what? They would sit in front of this and look at it. And I would say, what are you doing? It's nice, it's very nice to look at. At the back, they will get a drink. And I will, what are you doing? This thing is there. No, it's really nice, the light, and we are enjoying ourselves here. And, and, and as a designer, I can see this as a limitation of, oh, I didn't do it right because they are not doing what I thought they should do. But I see this most as, as an opportunity and always tell this, and this is very hard to, to, to take for designers. I say that design is never finished. And if we look at design as an open-ended process where we give things to one another and learn from what other people do, this is not a problem. Actually, it's, it's, it's the way we have been transforming through time. If we were able to specify the experience of others, that's the end of humanity. <laughs> In the way we know it, we will be like, like the little bird doing the same nest over and over again because we already know how to specify and we will live like that. But we are not like that. We want to experience new things and try new type of foods. I like Peruvian food and I cannot explain Peruvian food or any type of other food if I don't understand that this is a process of transformation that is gonna keep changing. Um, so in my work, in, in the game, what we do, we play roles. So we play as users, cli slash clients, whatever you wanna call them, and designers of one another, and we don't, we don't communicate with words. So the only way we communicate is that as a client, if I want something, the other to design for me, I will make a drawing of my experience using this canvas that I showed you at the beginning. As designer, I will get this strange drawing of our experience, which for me is not very different to say I want a house. 
I mean, if I use a word, whatever that architect knows about the house, and this is, if you ever have worked with an architect or been an architect, you will know that the architect will never give you back what you wanted. I mean, that's, and if you give it back what you wanted, probably you wouldn't like it. So the designer gets this, and, and this is hard for me also to explain to students, so it's not that they need to use this as a way to really make this experience as if it was an object. It's, it's an initial um, expression they use as, as part of their design intentions. But then, of course, they have their own experience. They have the materials that they like to use. I mean, I'm a designer, I like to use wood. I will design, I, I like to use wood, whatever. And I only have one week to make something. So even though it's open-ended, we have times and we have materials that we need to use sometime, right? So I will rearrange them, they will rearrange them, and then after we liked the soup that we put together, we invite somebody for dinner, and that person comes and try our soup without me telling, the, telling him what it was. I just came back from Colombia. Anybody's from Colombia here? Yeah, so they have this soup called the uh, Sancocho, and they will be in the Sancocho. That's a name, I don't know what Sancocho is. I mean, I have to try it, right? And now I know what Sancocho, probably the rest of people don't know what it is. So it's the same in design. You give this, this person come, even if, I, if they told me that's a Sancocho, I don't know. The Sancocho, now it's, I understand it because I've tried it. And then the designer observes. I told you I will repeat this question again. <laughs> what is this? So you get these weird things, right? The unrecognizables that I showed you before. And the, end, the game ends in one iteration because we iterate it multiple times where the user, so I will, I will review this again. The user will create this drawing, will give it to the designer. The designer will go to another room. They will not talk to each other. We'll make up something, we give it back, and the client will get this weird stuff. And we'll, what is this? So this is what happens. So here's the user receiving back this rearranged object, materials. And they don't tell each other what they are or what to do with them. <laughs> and then the designer will show their, his design intentions but without talking, through moving, again, moving the body here is key. And what is interesting to me is that these things do not have to match. If they will match, it's actually boring. Some of these examples actually match, and you know what happened when it, they matched? When you want when you want a house that you know what you want and the architect goes and work for a week and give you what you wanted, you probably will be really, I could have designed this, <laughs> come on, be more creative. So even though we think that we want to specify each other, we actually want to be surprised. We want to be transformed, we want to learn something from the other person. And it, this work, works both ways. As a user, I want to find an, a, something unrecognizable a new dish, I go to a restaurant and try it. Oh, this is really interesting. I, I was not expecting it. But also as a designer, if we break up and open up the process, we will find that we can learn. So the mismatch is interesting here because by observing one another, we can learn from one another. And this is not, it's not that the designer is wrong, it's not that the, the user or the client is wrong, it's actually both are creative and are actually part of an open-ended process of exchange, which is part of a culture, of course, which we, we actually learn from one another. So I say that design is not about matching experience, it's actually it's the, other, the other way around, it's mismatch. And the, the key concept here is coordination. <coughs> so when, I, when you were a baby again, and your mother uh, showed you the the yellow toy and told you, yellow, 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 or amarillo in Spanish. And then he, she told you, let's meet in the yellow door. And you meet there, you coordinated your experience. But that doesn't mean that you both, that the yellow is something that is, yellow is a word. So even though we mismatch our experiences then, and that's not a problem, we can coordinate our experience through naming the things that we bring. 
So what is, I like to give this example, but why, wh what is Steve Jobs doing when he, oh, the first day he, go, he did go and show the new materials that he and the team rearranged? He's, he's showing what, what to do with them. He's showing, he's demonstrating the same way this happens. And by calling the materials iPad or iPhone or whatever, you can then coordinate and like, gi mom, give me the iPod. Ah, she will give you the iPod. So we coordinate, we miss much experience and we coordinate our, our experiences, which is totally fine. And, and so we, we transform and coordinate. So I say that design is transformation through mismatching experiences and not actually matching. If we look at the process as a process which is open-ended and, and does not finish when you give something to somebody else. So, okay, it's gonna end soon, don't worry. So coming back to the first question, the problem even that I like to talk about, and, and, and Paul was introducing this at the beginning, that I'm not against technology. I mean, I'm teaching electronics and we're developing things but I feel that we are in, a, in this very amazing moment, but at the same time, it's a, it's, it's a key moment. I think people are realizing it. Uh, and we are transforming so fast and without reflection. So in the story of, of Icarus and Daedalus, Icarus got greedy and tr tried to reach the sun and then the wax that was holding the, uh, they melted and he, I don't want to be so negative. <laughs> But we are in this moment where we can, I feel this is very important, start really, if we, if we are interested in experience, let's, let's do it and, and, and look on how we are transforming the, our experiences and be reflective about it. And that doesn't mean we're not gonna keep changing. Actually, all, all my work is about creating new things, but then be able to see experientially how these things may or not may, affect, may be affecting our lives. And we have these new devices today, the, the, these things that we touch and communicate. And this is really for, the, you, are, you are really started realizing in your projects from last year also, so somebody did a box so you can put the phone and this, the phone is not connected anymore so you don't get stressed. There are things that are affecting us emotionally uh, and we just make things and make things and we don't take a moment to reflect and to reflect, we need to really have the vocabulary to be able to talk about the, the experience and its transformation. And that it was mainly my main goal behind all this work is basically about that. So I, I told you, I give you this vocabulary that I think it's one, one vocabulary that designers can use. It's, an, it's, a, evo, a, evo, a, it's not descriptions, are not definitions, it's evocations that we can like look at them through an awareness. But design is feeling what we're doing with materials. This is not just also like a nice explanation. Also for designers, we, we learn that uh, we, we name the materials when we bring about something new. And we, that we bring about this new experience through moving and not too much through making. So it's good to learn the technical and it's good to learn how to cut with a knife and how to use the 3D printing and the laser cutter. But then it, that's, I say that's not enough. You can replicate some Yoda head, but that's, that's what you can do. And then that we should really open up the process and understand that people, to the people that are with, we are designing for, they're not just, they're, they, they, they really are creative as well. I want to show you this part, so it's over, but this is the end of the story of my, of my Maxwell's dream. And this is the last time I'm going to ask you this. <laughs> what is this? Anybody knows? Yeah. Huh? But do you recognize it if you look at it? Yes. So, you, you got it? So we coordinate our experience, why I told you that, we transform and coordinate. So this is very interesting to me. After a year and a half or more, I got this, somebody knocked on my door in my office at MIT, they brought me this weird thing. They brought me this. Some students that they were there in my installation, they liked it, and after two years they wanted to build it up again. Which for me was like, this is amazing. And I wanna show you a video of their pres final presentation where they present this the thing they rearrange, and I wanna, and you have to trust me here, 
this is not a setup. This is what happened. And you will see, because of the video is not very good, you will, you will believe me. This is what they said. The magnets are interacting with each other, obviously, to cause the other ones to move. But what's causing it to light up is a um, iron reflectance sensor right behind the lever. That's why the tape is there, to reflect back and cause the sensor to... What is it called? Reflectance sensor. Oh, the actual display. Oh, Maxwell's <laughs> Maxwell's dream, ah. and uh, <laughs> oh, should I have said that? Like Maxwell's dream <laughs> at the beginning. So remember, at the beginning, people were asking me what the thing I designed was, and I didn't know. And I said, this is an art installation, but I called it Maxwell's dream. I named it, and these people came to this installation, and after experience this, they learned this name. And this thing appeared, and we coordinated our experience around it. And you said there, I show you what is inside a Maxwell stream. And it became a Maxwell stream. So if at the moment when they asked me, and I said a Maxwell stream, they said, what is this? Ah, an art installation. But now the Maxwell stream appeared as a thing with a name, because we have coordinated our experience around what to do and feel with this type of rearranged materials. And now we can go to the question. Thank you. I didn't realize all that making wasn't really making. It was actually doing. Moving. Yes. Is that a subset of doing? Yes. But why is it only moving? Why is it not all doing? No, I mean, through moving, you are touching, sensing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's part of the same, you're also thinking, it's all they're doing, but mm -hmm. then it, the way you can look at it when you observe, uh, it becomes some, some movement. Uh, yeah. So it's the moving movement, not the maker yeah. movement. Ah, yeah, I mean, you still have to rearrange materials. I call it rearrange materials. And then once you move with them, they appear. That's what they are, and you can say, I'm designing yes. a, a, this Maxwell stream. Yeah. In addition to a vocabulary, I feel like I need an epistemological guide to the shifts that have to occur in order to really understand the depth, because you're very elegantly redefining certain things, but also putting them into the doing and, and into the practice. I wanted to ask one clarification. When you start with any group in the workshop, yeah. you simply place the materials in front of them? Yes. So the thing is that I teach them also, actually this is kind of the way I get to do these workshops. They don't pay me to do this, they pay me to teach them Arduinos. And I give them, like, a, in Spanish we say we score them a goal without even, a soccer goal without even them asking for it. Uh, so, yeah, so I teach them to rearrange the sensors and the actuators, so I give them certain materials that they rearrange. And I, we also have there a series of mm -hmm. recycled materials, cardboard, like, mm -hmm. bottles, fabric, and that's kind of their kitchen, their pepper and their milk or whatever to rearrange. So, so they after you explain the materials, then you say, now do that's something the with them? Part. Yeah, yeah. So I tell them to explore what they, can, they, what they do and feel with these materials and what they could do and feel with these materials. And that's, what that I, that's what I said. Good. But I realized that the people, um, what is interesting to me is that this process works much better not in design schools, because in design schools they learn so many, so many other methods, so they start doing analysis or like, let's think, and they make drawings. But for example, with the communities and the blind, they didn't have any problem. They will start rearranging the materials right away. We also have to say, don't make a 3D model, please. So, 3D modeling, for example, I don't allow it in the, the, this game has certain rules so they cannot use 3D modeling. Mm -hmm. So I want them to engage directly with the materials as mm -hmm. much, as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. But I realize that still they, they define these design intentions. So then I give a space for them to do so, but then, and that's what I talk about the, in my thesis too, then those design intentions disappear. So those design intentions allow you to start Mm -hmm. I'm going to design a bicycle, whatever. But then you start rearranging these materials, and then you find something different. Can you bring the model up for a moment? Yeah. I don't know where it is. Uh, maybe. So you've answered one question, which for most of it I wasn't sure, in that you 
don't tell them what to make. You tell them how the pieces fit together, because that's why you're paid, because they're learning Arduino. And in this right-hand circle, yes. they're experimenting with the materials, if experimenting is an OK word. They're creating an experience. D is for designer. And they continue this rearrangement process. Yes. And then at some point, yes. they've accumulated something, which is somehow coherent or whole or com not so, complete, but. So you're cooking, and suddenly you say, I like this soup. I right. want to give it to somebody else. Good. And that's show the arrow where that happens. Yeah, so they give it to somebody else. And what happens in this loop then? Then that person comes and tries and tries the soup. And you can observe whether they eat it all. Whether so who is the you in that sentence? The, the other person. The other, mm -hmm. Well, the other person's observing themselves, but the designer is observing the other person. The other person. Yeah. And drawing what? what goes on in the designer's mind as a consequence of watching? So, so for me, the imp important part of this model is that this, the designer is a key. So he's observing. And sometimes, even though we observe, we don't put ourselves there. So the designer, if he looks at somebody smiling, the thing I was saying at the beginning, he will like, understand the feeling of other in the light of, the, of his own. But also through observing. And this happens all the time in design, not only when you when you talk about the user, but for example, like I will design something, show it to my professor, I will hate my design. Really, I we feel this is horrible design. And my professor will look at it, no, but look, this is very cool. You can, and you're like, ah, yeah, mm. this is good. Mm. I, probably uh, to all of you, this has happened. The materials are exactly the same. They have not changed. Mm -hmm. I'd but like to through, start. Yeah. I'd like to start with questions about the diagram and then not restricted to that. But. Yes, sorry, just a quick question. So you said when you hand it to another designer, yeah. that it, I'll use the word failure. Maybe it's not failure, but boring because they, they use it exactly how you yes. intended yes. versus that's how you, you were like, ah, oh, bummer, yeah, yeah. versus, oh, yeah. cool, OK. Yeah. yeah, it happened. Like, for example, one group, when you design something that is recognizable, for example, one group will design with this thing. This happens to me usually with engineers. I'm sorry, but they will design one will design a bag with an alarm that you can open and make sound. You will give it. You will see, and I, I have this in my thesis. The person that that will come back and see this will be right away like, huh, really? Like, yeah, of course. Too. And it will be a little bit uncomfortable actually because there's nothing. Real, you're not really learning, and not and the, and the, also the user, whatever you want to call it, will not really be contributing. So he feels like he's not, does, he doesn't have to even be there showing this because. Yeah, the richness is in the, is in the mismatch. In mismatch, yeah. Yeah, um, I appreciate what you're saying very much. And I, I, I have a question, I guess. Yes. Uh, inquisitive or just a curiosity. And then also something I'd like to, to share, because actually many of us sitting in the front row here, we design a lot for children. Uh -huh. And, and this is a very interesting model, I think, that we can recognize very well, because our user over here, one, uh, cannot very often express the design intent of what they're looking for. Yeah. And two, are experts at mismatching. So um, in this process, whenever we do something and arrange materials and, and do that and pass it back, we will almost always get a very uh, natural, open, unfiltered uh, reuse, or whatever you yeah. would call that here, yeah. right? Experience of what we've made. Yes. And, and, and I think we've, we really live on that. We live on that mis mismatch. Yeah. And, and you're very right. I mean, if they use it exactly the way we thought, we're kind of like, well, then we didn't really think hard enough. Yeah. So I, I guess a few things. I'm wondering if you've ever had the chance. I, I appreciate the very much getting out of the design world and, and working with the blind or the Fisher people who, who don't, you know, whatever, think in, in models or think of designing uh, something. But have you had a chance to work with, uh, with children at all? I, I, I work with children, not so in young as I would, would like. And uh, like 14 years old, it's not, it's not, I would like maybe, I don't know what age do you work? Well, we work from, yeah, everything from two, everything from two 
basically enough. Yeah. Yeah. I will imagine that this is related. That's why also children are so creative because they're open. They're opening to learn and they don't know many words, yeah. so they keep improvising with the materials that they get. Right. For us, we get something and we, we do what we know what to do with that thing right, right away because we, we have learned it and we are fixed. Right. Uh, so with this, uh, I've done this with, um, uh, and the way I've, I've done it is we also design games with them. So they design these games that they, they want to play for themselves and for, for, their, for their peers. Um, and yeah, it happens, but I, I think they're a little bit too old so the I will I will really maybe would like to explore how mm -hmm. to how this will work with younger uh, yeah. with younger people. Mm -hmm. But thanks for for the comment. Hey, so I'm wondering kind of what the barrier to entry or just maybe incentive is um, for people to actually start this process. So with your students, it's more they're learning the Arduino, and that's why they're going to create these things. So I'm wondering more in Chile, like what are you telling these people to have them start interacting with these things? Because they seem to create things that are maybe more kind of useful for their surroundings. Mm -hmm. um, so are you telling them at the beginning, hey, we're going to come together and like figure out what you guys need so we can build it for you? Or is it more of an experimentation where you're saying, let's see what happens, maybe you'll learn something, maybe you won't. Like, what is the incentive what that I you're giving them? them? What do you, yeah, what yeah, it, No, for them, I have to be very careful. So for them, I don't, because these things are not, they design and they kind of work in a way, but they're not products that you can like then, I mean, these are sure. like, so uh, f the way I frame it for them is mostly like a learning experience about understanding what it means to be, to be a designer and to empower them to, re for me, like the big realization that pe these people had, and I think at the end of the day, that's much more important than everything I said, is that they, they, they first of all, understand most technologies that they have. Uh, I mean, all technologies at the end of the day have this little computer inside the, f the smartphone, and they have sensors, and they, this, the phone, they has a light and drivers, they have the effectors, so they learn the, the electronics, and they learn that they could design their own. For them, this is big thing because they are in these communities far away, uh, where they don't even have access to a computer or whatever. And then they learn. I, for them, before doing this, no, this is only something that people in the United States can do. We we cannot. We are not. We are not. And these people are people that don't have higher education either. So they, they haven't gone through it. So it's maybe a matter university. of like giving them a little power as well. They feeling empower like they have them power over these to realize that they, they could do things and that they could do things for themselves. And this is part of a bigger program that I'm involved with where I'm trying to develop design and like innovation for the communities. So my, the way I took it for me is to give them, give them empower them so that then when they talk with other people, they, they know what is a sense or they know this and they understand that they don't have to be scared about like technologies or whatever that they could like really be empowered. That's the way I frame it. Yeah. What problem were you trying to solve, Danielle, when you developed this model? Oops. This is also this is I'm gonna tell you, this is uh, I could do a, another uh, loop here because this is also a Maxwell thing. I mean that's why I wanna hear from you because I'm doing these things, and I'm doing it with people and then I do it them again. And I'm discover. I'm like bringing this so, spontaneously. So we're over here. All this, and to, and me today. I'm also a material for you. Are, are here. Oh, we are the materials. No, I am. I all this, this, the, this, this light here, and I, me too. You, I'm, are here, and you are, you are ex listening okay. to me. And like I'm observing you too. But but you didn't answer the question. What problem? So I don't have any problem. I'm okay. not solving a he problem. He has no problem. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. That's a good situation to be in. No, I I really like uh, what you were talking about uh, designing these unrecognizables or like um, like making that into a word. But um, when in this process, um, like two two things. Like when in this process is the right moment to give something a name, like start mm -hmm. labeling. Because uh, because you said something interesting, it's like in the beginning you you like saying don't give it names, don't refer to it, yeah. so leave that out. I think that's a really interesting yeah. process. And and the second one is like who's to give that name? Because in the Maxwell stream you were the one giving it, right? Because yeah. if if you hadn't given it, maybe it's been a bit like 
the atrium thingy yeah. that moves or like whatever like atrium uh, machine maybe that would have been the name right yeah. so like who's to when to give the name and, and who's to give yeah. it so so for when i've done on my thesis also what i realized that this is a gradu gradual process mm -hmm. and even some of you when you recognize when you talk about the name of these materials you talk about them by making up a, a, the machine, the drawing machine. So mm -hmm. people at the beginning, mm -hmm. they will describe, they will make up these pre-names which are evocations of the experience. So they will say, the glove with which we could touch the wall from a distance. And that will be the kind of like a pre-name, big name, which actually is an evocation of what they actually, is an evocation of the experience. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's no right moment per se. Throughout the process, you keep renaming with bigger or smaller name, and at the end you say the eye glove, whatever, and you, you give it a name. Regarding the other thing, I will say that everybody can name whatever they want, but then of course when I'm presenting something, I can say this is a sancocho, and I'm trying, to, and I will tell you, you will ask me what is this, and I'm as a designer, I will tell you the name that I put it with, and like people do that. I mean, you, you, you launch the new iPhone and say, this is an iPhone 6. People, when you talk about this, call it iPhone 6. So then you can coordinate your experience around that name. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the name could not be different. Uh, and we do it, we, we kind of, but the designer actively, and I will say, without even realizing it, I think people don't realize that, that they give it, they give a name and then they tell others, like, look, I did this. I, I make, a, that's why the making of a thing is tricky because you, we need to talk about things in that way. We use these words. So then you will ask a designer, what are you making? No, I'm making a, a, a blah, blah, blah. I'm making this thing, right? You give it a name because you need to be able to talk about it. But the pre-naming thing I thought was very interesting because usually, it, and people say the, the machine for drawing, it, they will make up longer sort of descriptions or evocations for the actual experience. And then they will kind of maybe shorten it and call it like uh, at the end, maybe when they have to give a presentation and they have to put it into a slide, they will put it like a, the, 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 the da da da, whatever. Hi, uh, I'm, I kind of understand that it's a pretty interesting way of making people, uh, users, to kind of play around with material and see how they actually, uh, you know, use materials differently to have a newer thing or something which previously they haven't related to. I'm very curious to know what, how is it that you create your kit? I mean, what are the thoughts that go into creating a kit that you actually take around and use for your exp experiments? For the, the materials? The materials that yeah. you use. So the material I thought about, well, I really like electronics, and I was designing this thing with electronics mm -hmm. before. So I thought, I mean, you could think about other type of materials, even like food for the same sort of process. But in my case, I like the electronics, I use electronics. And also I get paid because I use electronics. Mm -hmm. But uh, in my case, I look for sensors and effectors that are pretty, uh, that involve the movement. And I now reflect, at the, at the moment, maybe I didn't do so. Mm -hmm. So I use a pressure sensor that you press, this, uh, an accelerometer where you move, uh, the distance sensor where you. So you basically don't have any particular thought in like picking up maybe two pressure sensors and one proximity sensor and maybe a belt and maybe some pieces of cardboard. You yeah, right. So then I give them this sort of set of different materials that they have in the, their kitchen and then they, they know that the pepper is like spicy and because they, they have, they, I, I show them and then they start rearranging these materials. Uh, yes, but then once I realized that the Arduino thing was for me, actually this is very instrumental, I have to be honest. Like what happened to me is that Arduino took really long time. And for people like, it's, it's kind of a, you need a computer, connect, it takes a while. While you, when you're cutting cardboard and putting some masking tape, you're like, like right away moving and doing things. So the spaghetti idea was to kind of try to get closer to that 
where you could put it around directly and connect the sensors and we don't have to connect the computer and then map it out directly and be able to change it as directly as possible. Of course, it's much more limited than to what you can do with an Arduino. I mean, with Arduino you can do much more, more other things. So yeah. basically what I was trying to come to is that as designers, we, or even as people and more so as designers, we have a certain preconceived thoughts yeah. about how certain things can be used, yes. how can be used. So we tend to, I mean, our decisions for make, like in this respect, making the kit are kind yes. of biased, you know, yes. like probably if I use a cardboard and I give a belt maybe and put some sensors, people will make something which would hang. For example, you know, yes. if I give a belt, I can just put it inside and hang it. So, uh, I mean, do you like kind of get those moments and get For example, past? yeah, in my case, I never thought people would do mostly wearables. Okay. I mean, I didn't expect it. I, I, th I mean, I'm an architect, so like, I thought they would yeah. do and like, I don't know, it's very, because this thing you touch, whatever, they will put them around and it would be most, so it was also like us, yeah, in that way. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, so you are, you have a, an architectural background? Very far away, but well, yes. Me too, and, <laughs> and I'm actually, that's why I'm asking this. Because I, I had the opportunity to work as a, as a professor. Uh -huh. And um, usually in architecture school, um, you would ask, an, or they would ask you, to develop a process uh, as a design intention. Yes. And then, for example, you would be explaining your project. Yes. And then uh, you would, thank you. You would, um, you, you would have um, a cylinder shape building. Yes. And then when you would be explaining that project as a student, for example, you would be saying, I have to present you the perfect prism yeah. Right. And then you know that, of course, you don't realize that you're explaining your project uh, incorrectly or as an uninformed mismatch. Yes. Okay. So the question would be, what do you think the difference between you as an architect and now as a different, in a, as a designer in a different field is? So what's the difference that you can see in terms of the process of designing an intention just before you get into that uh, process? I think there's no difference to me in okay. design or cooking or anything that we do is the same. That's what I think. But different things what the architect thinks they do. Okay, okay. so I was the other way. I, I sometimes I invited to some reviews and like this was the student that got a brief from the professor to do a project with the lease with everything. And the student did exactly what the professor asked. It was an amazing project according to the brief. But the professor was not surprised. What is this? You, this, this is, he called it, this is too professional. <laughs> this project is exactly, I mean, so you could have initial design intentions. And I think that's why I, sometimes I, I don't like about architecture education that they don't see what is actually happening in the process, which is amazing actually, but they don't see it. The way I look at it, I see this is, this is great. You are like bringing out something to the professor and he's looking at it, give, telling you what to do next. But the design intentions for me as, a, as, an, as, a, as the student, it's like, the, it's like Pollock used to put some paint on the sponge and throw it on the wall. And then he looks at the wall. So you can have initial design intentions, but then through the process and we forget we're not honest. You, we, you create a story at the end, very rational, why your project is like this, and you're not telling the truth. You didn't really think about this when you started. Be, be, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's true. But it's true. Like you will say, I'm gonna do this at the beginning, and you have all this, and you will define intentions, which will, which will be the sponge for you to start painting. But once you start picking up things and put them there, Suddenly, maybe you will look at it horizontally, say like, oh, this is, and then you'll say, no, this is a, let's do a cylinder. Because, and you will make up an explanation because the sun moves like this, and architects love these explanations about the, the efficiency and green buildings, and this is much more sustainable. Come on, you do the curve because you like the curve. 
<laughs> Don't tell me that you did the curve because <coughs> it's more efficient. <laughs> and, 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 uh, yes, it's, a, it's just a quick uh, question. So you, uh, you, you were mentioning that the, whenever you were um, doing the experiment down in Chile, you had a different um, result because they, you, you just mentioned that they just started to do it right away. Yes. Do you think that would, that might be related to the art of seeing by Huxley? The more you see, the more you know, or the more you know, the more you see. Yeah, I don't know about that, about that uh, quotation. For me, it's very simple. With designers, they know too much about design. So I had to make them unlearn what they know. With the people that don't know design, this goes, it's like the little children. They just go and start playing around. But design is, no, we need to find an intention. We need to think something smart. And they, they and we need to analyze the user's needs and go do interviews or something. I don't want to offend anybody, but and that's fine to do. You can define these design intentions and then reflect at the end to what your design intentions were. So one problem that this solves is that it unlearns designers. Please. Thank you. Please. I have a, a couple of questions. How long have you been working on Maxwell Stream? How much I work? How long have you been working on that project? I mean, I, I, I mean it's still there, kind of. When I'm did you start? How long ago? Uh, maybe three years, four three years ago. Three years ago. And this process is kind of a result of that project. Was an, kind of, was an initial sort of... It was born from that from project. That. I appreciate the process very much. My question is, how do you know when you're done? Like, are, what are the, you know, you know are there in, any filters In that tell case, you? I had a deadline. There was the 150th anniversary of MIT, yes. and people will come that day to see to what I, I have to do. Um, but you're still iterating. I mean, you, yeah, I mean, I mean you're, you put you're it there. Actually, when I, 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 I should include that part too. When I put it there, so this thing, this is more like electronic problem, but I, I, I will always look at this individually and they work perfect. But when they put, I put them all together, they start uh, coupling. I don't know if you know that the cable, so this start making sounds. Mm -hmm. Like you will move them and and. and then I thought about that it could have been actually cool. I never, when I, I was installing it, right in the, like 20 minutes before people would come. But I was like, no, this is not right. And I, I picked some guy from the media lab that I know he's like the great guy in electrical engineering. And he like, no, this, you, you need to put additional, like we put some capacitors in the back, whatever, and the sound went away. But then looking back, I think could I actually, I mean, they were making sound when you move them, and it was an annoying sound, but still. <laughs> uh, so I think, for me, this is an open-ended process, and you know, and, and people like, I like to talk about cooking because people have experienced it. When you like, like something that you have made, even if you make, can make it like maybe better, whether you wanna maybe show it to somebody. Hey, look, try this. When you touch this thing and say, oh, this is cool, I show it to somebody, look, do you think we should maybe do this instead of putting it there? Yeah, yeah it's kind of cool. That's when you know. And you know, uh, and also when you, are, you run out of time. So it's open-ended process and you have to deliver and you just give it and then that's what it is. So it's never finished. Right. Just again, what was the, what was the original intent? Of it that was project? like a uh, thing that, like a, a kind of like a thing you will hang, like an I call, we call it an analog projector uh -huh. that will have all these little, they will be smaller with magnets, and then we will project from behind, and then like people will stand in front of the wall, and according to the way they will be moving, the patterns will follow the, the movement, but you will never touch it. Gotcha. Because yeah. it seems so natural when you look at it. Why wouldn't you touch that? But, yeah, yeah, uh, but yeah. I mean, like when you, I, that's the thing, when you look at it, I was all the time, when I was rearranging it, I was doing that analog projector. I never thought about touching it. Yeah. It's not intentional. The intention was not before. It, I mean, spontane spontaneity is very important yeah. word. It, it, it became spon a spontaneous process. 
we had a project that actually Debbie was working on that we had we had designed it or she had designed it so that it was two people. Two kids were supposed to sit back to back and they were gonna go back and forth, they're gonna push, they're gonna push. We brought in a bunch of kids and they piled on the thing. And I'm like, wait, it's broken. It's not right. Like, no, wait, it's not broken. They're doing exactly what they should be doing, which yeah. is just learning and yeah. growing. It was really cool. Yeah. But it was a very big surprise. We were like, wow, yeah. this is great. For example, a word that I avoid a lot is interpretation. And this is the Maturana. So the people are not interpreting what you made in a different way. They are bringing forth right. what, they, what, they do, what, what they do, this thing appears to them. Yeah. And it's not that they are interpreting my, my so I, if I like, I'm an architect and I design a house with a living room and I can write on the floor plan living room and then I rearrange these materials and the person comes there and put a bed there and sleeps there, she's not interpreting my living room as a, door, as a, as a bedroom. She's just leaving the bedroom. Who, who's going to tell that? I mean, if she likes... If you, if you're, if you're, if you're, if as a designer, your your motivation is to specify the experience of another person, then when you see that, you may say to yourself, "I'm a bad designer." But if 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 you are not like that, and for you, uh, you are kind of even like like the idea that she did whatever she wanted. You could say I'm a good designer, so it's a comment. It's it's a commentary. It's not a, it's not an absolute value. It cannot be an absolute yeah, I, value. I, I was more in, I'm more looking at from the perspective of uh, like it was an observation that uh, you know somebody had, and uh, you kind of design or you kind of uh, work around that observation, and it is a reflection of your observation. Yes. But your ob observation. Uh, how it is perceived by the other person. Uh, of course, it, it, when I say good design, I don't mean if somebody puts their bed, it's a bad design. It's probably a broadening the scope of your design. So uh, what is your opinion on that? For me, that's what I'm saying. It's not an absolute value. And I could be very upset. People came and they did this with my design. So I'm a very bad designer because they didn't I didn't design it well, so they could like not. But somebody else can come to me, and I really believe I'm a bad designer. I believe it. But somebody else can come and say, look, but this is actually really cool. They are playing around with this. And, this. and I would say, ah, really? I'm a very good designer. I think in the same way that yeah. you've shifted from maker to making to moving, yeah. you're shifting our imagination of what designer means. It's not, I made this. I want you to have what I made. It's, I offer this. What do you want? or some articulation like that, which you do much more eloquently here. And I think that shift might be the nice moment to say that our design of this moment will now shift to some drinks. We hope you'll join us and hope you'll thank Danielle for a wonderful presentation. Uh, thanks for coming.